Hey everyone, and thanks for tuning in today to the Driven to Better podcast, where everyone you'll hear is driven to make business better. I'm your host, Justin Sisley, and on the show today is Leah Sugar, co-founder of House Logic. She's going to share with us her journey to entrepreneurship, including her early days with her father's company, which created a product that I bet you've all heard of. So stay tuned to hear about it. We've got a great show coming up. We have with us today Leah Sugar, who is an entrepreneur here in Madison, Wisconsin, where we're based. Hi. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, so we're going to talk to you today about your entrepreneurial ventures. We were talking a little bit beforehand, and you've had a, a long, actually a long journey through entrepreneurship already um, since you were a kid, it sounds like. Yeah, so, that's true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, tell us, give us, uh, I guess let's start out with just a, a brief intro of your current business. What are you, what are you doing right now? Yeah. So my company's called House Logic. Um, we're an LLC. We started in, uh, officially in May, although I've been working on the project since January. Obviously, we've been thinking about it for many years before that. Um, our first product just launched this summer, and it's a spice rack for people who have a lot of spices. So people who are serious home cooks. Um, the background is uh, my brother actually designed it. Um, we were living together in Oakland, California, and we did a lot of cooking. We were really into um, sustainable food and, and doing a lot of home cooking. And like a lot of people who do a lot of home cooking, your spice spices and spice drawers just get completely out of control. You have mm-hmm. stuff everywhere, and it just turns into a huge mess. So we started looking at what was available for spice racks. And we got some of those spinny ones, and we got like some that you hang on the wall. And they all had a capacity of like... 12 to 24 spices and we had like 60 70 80 okay. and um, they took up tons of counter space and they were kind of cutesy and it was just not didn't really fit our style so um, my brother is a very practical guy he went down into the workshop and built a spice rack and um, ended up building another one and another one and another one and pretty soon um, when we didn't live together anymore I had one and then my dad had one and my mom had one and Everybody who came to visit us said, oh, those are so cool. Where do you get those spice racks? Uh, you know, that whole story. And um, at the time, we both had full-time jobs. And so we said, this is a cool idea, but we'll get to it at some point. And that was probably about five, six years ago. Okay. So now we're finally at a point where we could launch the spice rack, and we're super excited about it. Um, we just found out we're going to be able to have different colors and customized labels and all this fun stuff that we've been kind of dreaming about for years. So it's really exciting. And um, we launched uh, at the beginning of August um, with Kickstarter, and now we're taking pre-orders uh, through December, and then we'll ship in December. So awesome. that's awesome. what I'm working on now. Well, Kickstarter, you already hit on something that I knew I wanted to ask you, so we'll, we'll get into it a little bit later, mm-hmm. um, but that's definitely something I want to talk more about. Um, but first, let, why don't you tell us, how long have you been an entrepreneur? It's a kind of a funny question <laughs> for me okay. because it's... Um, it's kind of been my life. I, I grew up in a family that had a family business, and um, my dad started his company um, when I was 14. So um, it's really all I can remember. Um, and it's definitely different now being in the position where I'm actually uh, the founder and the owner of the company um, versus just being a family member. But I still did go through all of those things like, if this doesn't work, we might lose our house and all those yeah. kinds of things growing up. So um, this is space is really comfortable for me, but, um, the company that my dad started when I was a kid was a publishing company called out of the box publishing. And they're most well known for their game apples to apples, which, um, was super successful. So that was a really, really fun ride. Um, I literally remember being 15 years old, playing the game in prototype form on my living room floor with my friends and just playing for hours and hours and hours. And, it was pretty clear right, right away that there, there was a winner there. Um, so I did uh, trade shows and helped with prototypes and all those things growing up. Um, went to college, still did trade shows all the way through um, college, and then went and got my requisite uh, corporate job at Target and okay. worked for Target <laughs> for a couple of years. And that was a really good experience, especially since that was right at the time that Apples to Apples was going into Target. So I got to see uh. both sides of it, which was really cool. And, you know, Target, they're an awesome training grounds for office politics and um, just how to deal with all sorts of different things. So I've kind of always been on the consumer product side of things and um, always really liked like tangible stuff. So this is a really um, good position for me to be in. So then after Target, I um, did one other small job in between where I picked out sunglasses for a 
um, drugstore, which was kind of fun, but then um, went to, so my dad sold off Apples to Apples and a couple other products to Mattel and sold the rest of the company to one of his partners. And then his partner immediately called me and my brother and asked us to join the company. And so he and I um, have worked together for six years. Um, we worked for the publishing company. He did product design and development and I did marketing. Um, and then we both left in January, although we're both still owners of that company. Okay. And then uh, started working on this somewhat full time. Um, I'm in school. Uh, my brother's also in school, and so it's really nice balance. I have a family, and so being able to have the family, the business, and school is just it's it's a great uh, great life. We'll see how things go as it gets busier. But yeah, that that's definitely the draw for a lot of entrepreneurs. It's just that that flexibility and that freedom mm -hmm. to not have to punch a clock nine to five every day you can yeah you can make things work uh, a lot better than you could if you were still working at target corporate i'm sure yeah absolutely it's a really nice balance for me so you've you've had uh, experience with a couple businesses so your your current business is not the first go around for you um and you said so you've been in this business now with the spice racks and you're going to make other products too right yeah, forward. so House Logic is the parent brand, and then All Spice is the brand of the Spice Racks. Okay. And then we've kind of left it open. Um, House Logic, the idea is that it's going to be a products company and it's going to be um, things that make your life better and work better, and um, just not necessarily organizational, but just things that overall make your life function better. So okay. we've got a whole lot of other things in the pipeline, including expansions on the spice line, uh, the spice rack line, but also um, other things, books and um, products for your garage and all sorts of different other things that we've got in okay. the hopper. Starting with the end in mind, as they say. <laughs> so that's great. Um, so you're doing it um, almost full time then, would you say? Um, yeah, usually there. it's, uh, right now it's about half time, um, somewhere between seven and three, usually I'm working, um, and then I have a two-year-old son who I pick up at three and then go to school in the evenings. So it's, it's a, definitely a full day, um, but right now we're able to maintain a pretty decent balance. Well, Leah, it sounds like you have kind of a natural um, transition into entrepreneurship, or maybe not even a transition. You were kind of born into it and are continuing to live um, that lifestyle. Um, but we, we want to talk a little bit kind of about your beginning. Um, maybe we'll start with House Logic since it's your most current uh, endeavor. And if you don't mind, we're going to ask a couple questions about some of the, the business side of things um, and even investment and funding. Yeah, um, absolutely. That's that's totally fine. It's been, it's been an interesting um, kind of transition into that for me. It was not what I expected to do when I left the publishing company, so. <laughs> sure. Now, now, was House Logic something that you were able to self-finance or bootstrap, as they say, in entrepreneurship? Yeah, or that's that's actually the nice thing about the way the company has been working. Um, it's We're able to do it fairly lean. Uh, we all work from home. I've worked from home for six years, and I, I love working from home. I'm it's the kind of thing that some people can do and some people can't do. Sure. Um, but for me, it works really well. And so all of us are working from home right now. Um, I talked a little bit about how we started with Kickstarter and now we're doing pre-orders and that definitely helps the, from the financial perspective. Um, but also, uh, you know, we're just able to do things on, on a pretty lean budget. Um, I did the website myself and we're doing a lot of it on our own and just building on things as we as we make them happen. So it's it has not been too um, much of a financial burden and luckily we're able to do it on our own. Although, and to be honest, this is kind of my background. This is how I grew up. The company, the publishing company um, that I grew up with was entirely self-financed and um, nice. I'm much more comfortable with the pain of I could be broke, then I could have all these other people broke and breathing down my neck. So for me, oh, that's right. just my comfort place. I think if I were doing a tech company, I would probably have a completely different outlook on the situation. But for, for now, this is working. Nice. And yeah, you mentioned, you know, you've always kind of been a fan of tangible products. Mm -hmm. um, so that probably lends itself well to to self-financing. Yeah, it's, it's well, that's the wonderful thing about, you know, Kickstarter and other sorts of pre-ordering pre possibilities is that that makes it so much more doable for people now. I think, um, you know, that's a little bit of a scary thing going into anything, any kind of manufactured product because I'll be honest, the, the way we found the first manufacturer we were working with for the um, Spice Rack 
we mm-hmm. went to Google and searched for wooden box manufacturers in China. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was so sad. And the, the really sad part is that, like, we all came from this publishing company where we produce things overseas all the time. We're all very accustomed to that. But okay. this is different, and it's every single time you do it, you kind of have to start from the beginning a little bit. Um, and now we're actually working with a different company um, who we're really excited about. But um, that can be a little bit scary because there is that whole, like, we're going to have to send this money to China, and we have no idea what's coming back. And, you know, on your first round, um, your first go-around, that's very nerve-wracking. So keeping the minimums low and keeping, mm-hmm. you know, the overhead low – um, makes it much more bearable. Now, did you shop around at all um, on U.S. soil before you decided to outsource to China? Oh, yeah. That was the, that was the original plan was to do okay. it, um, American production, and we would love to do American production. Um, and, you know, one of the funny things about the spice rack and the interesting thing that we've learned is um, when you look – so our spice rack is um, 60 jars – Okay. And uh, we do it by jar count because there are actually jars included. So it's an incredibly organized looking system when you get it finished, but it requires that it's all completely uniform jars. And having been people who have bought, you know, tomato sauce and all these other things in jars all our lives and then thrown the jars right in recycling, you think of jars as completely disposable, but they're not. They they cost money. And um, that's a very expensive thing to buy in the U.S. Um, So we looked at, you know, is it possible to do the wood part here and the jars overseas? And we've looked at a hundred different ways of a hundred different combinations of putting things together. And, um, the, there's a lot of manual labor to this that unfortunately we're not able to do in the U S right now. Although that's definitely one of my short term goals is to get, um, kind of an artisan rack that's handmade by we've had a couple of them done by various carpenters and they're really spectacular um these hand-built racks so having our standard rack that's available you know much more accessible financially for most people and then also having this artisan rack that's hand-built with these specialty woods and all those sorts of things um is one of my long-term goals nice but yeah, finding a manufacturer is is a very very challenging piece of doing a, a physical product. Um, I would imagine if if I were doing a more more of a technology related project I would, product, I would think it would be even more complicated. But we were surprised with wood at how expensive it is and how challenging it is to get somebody who can work with wood well and and make sure. it look nice and beautiful like a piece of furniture. Absolutely. So do you have a, a trip to China in store? We actually took one this summer. I didn't get to go, unfortunately, <laughs> but my brother went. I mean, he's doing most of the product design and development, so it made the most sense for him to go. Um, so he went and met with a man, one of our manufacturers, and uh, it was a very interesting, enlightening experience. I'm it sure. was a tiny, tiny town out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the guys, one of the guys spoke English. Nobody else did. People were barefoot in the factory. There was... Um, you right know, up, it was just completely, it was completely open air, totally different than what we had expected and, and not necessarily representative of every Chinese factory. There are a lot of Chinese factories that are these huge places that are super organized and tidy. This one was not. Um, and this is actually the manufacturer that we decided not to go with, not the one that we are going with in the end. But um, they actually took my brother out on a cicada hunt to go look for cicadas to, to eat. I was because say, was that, that's was a specialty that. of this time of year, and it was very exciting for them. And luckily, my brother is the kind of guy who will try anything, and he was yeah. totally up for it. <laughs> he thought that was very, very cool and and super welcoming. Talk about an adventure! Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but I would I, I would highly recommend that anybody who does overseas manufacturing go and visit the factories. It's a huge burden and challenge, but totally worth it in the end. It was an incredible educational experience for us. It was a good um, ability for us to um, get to know those partners and and make stronger partnerships and those sorts of things. Nice. Very cool. And then lastly, before we move on to the next section, um, you mentioned that you're in school right now. Is -hmm. is that um, to get, you know, more educated for the type of work you're doing now? Or tell us a little bit about your... Yeah, um, I'm actually in school to get my MBA. So yes, in some in some respects, yes. 
Um, it's it's an interesting thing because I started the program before I knew that I would be kind of going off on my own and founding a business. Um, and it's always been in the back of my mind, but you know, I wasn't really sure how the MBA program here at I'm here at the University of Wisconsin Madison. I wasn't sure how it would fit in with the uh, entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and there have been a few classes here and there where they're talking about big organizational structures that really are not related to the type of things that I'm doing. But um, yep. right now I've got a finance and marketing class and the marketing class has been amazingly useful All for right. what I'm doing. And I actually found that in my undergrad here at the university too. I think uh, one of the things the UW-Madison is particularly um, a particularly practical school and sure. that's one of the things I've really appreciated about it is that the the type of education I'm getting is a very hands-on education and the type of education that I can actually apply to my business on a day-in, day-out basis. Yeah. Um, now, on the other hand, I told you my brother, who's my business partner, is also in school. He's going for horticulture. So <laughs> <laughs> completely different, um, but just something that he's really passionate about and into. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the way that we grew up was that it was a follow your passion and, and do the things that you love and, and everything will work out. Um, and so we've both kind of done that. And for me, I'm interested in the business side of it. I love it. And I would be enjoying the MBA program, whether I was doing this or not, but it has been actually surprisingly useful. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's nice to, you know, kind of think through that lens of your own business as you're learning about you know, from so many others. Yeah, yeah. We had a class on last week about um, pricing and about how to look at competitors' products and price your own product in comparison to competitors' products. And I thought, huh, that's so funny because literally earlier that day we were talking about what are the competitors out there and how do we need to price in comparison to the pet competitors. Just exactly the same thing. So very helpful. Well, now we're going to talk about uh, the, the part that maybe everybody doesn't like to talk about so much, but it's a part of every entrepreneur's journey, and that is the failures. Um, so ha have you ever had anything, any of your business ventures completely fail? Or if not, um, you know, tell us about at least one you know, kind of failure that sticks out in your mind. Um, the two businesses that I own right now, or the two businesses that I've ever owned, have not shut doors yet, so <laughs> we haven't okay. had any complete failures. But um, yeah, I mentioned earlier that we did a Kickstarter, and while we consider the experience of doing the Kickstarter a success, we didn't meet our goal. So um, in a lot of ways, that would be considered a failure. And we um, went through a lot of different ways of looking at it, and whether it was a success or a failure, through lots of different lenses. And um, in the end, we're, we're extremely happy with the way that it went, and we're extremely happy that we did it. Um, but you know, it does sting not to hit your goal. Hey everyone, thanks again for listening. I want to break in quickly just to give a quick shout out and thank you to our sponsors, starting with MadisonInABox.com. It's the perfect gift for anyone with a connection to the great city that I call home. Someone who used to live here is a university alum or maybe just someone who would appreciate a taste of our local culture. Send friends, family, and loved ones the gift of Madison in a box. Head over to MadisonInABox.com to learn more about this unique gift idea. Our other sponsor for the show is Frutera.co. Get ready to blend organic smoothies in under 30 seconds. And the best part is they're shipped right to your door. There's several flavors to choose from, so head over to Frutera.co to learn more. And while you're there, drop them an email. Say, hey, thanks for sponsoring the Driven to Better podcast. I really appreciate it. All right, back to the show. Okay. So um, I can give a little bit more background and how the Kickstarter went. and, and... Well, yeah, I, I guess my, my I'm pretty sure it's pretty popular now. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people understand how it works. If you don't hit your goal, you don't get the money, correct? Exactly. Any of it. And for us, it, that actually worked out as being a benefit um, because because of the type of product we have. So one of the, we learned a lot about the type of product we have in the Kickstarter environment. And we kept wondering why there's no Spicer X and that type of thing on Kickstarter. Well, we learned that there's, there's a couple different reasons for that. And one, that our target market is a little bit different than um, the, the target market of Kickstarter. We're t generally going for an older crowd, a crowd that's, you know, a little bit, um, th they tend to have a house, they tend to be in an older generation, and, and maybe not so savvy with Kickstarter. But at the same time, um, they're the type of people who are not flash in the pan type of people. If they make the decision that this is a product that they're interested in, they stick with that decision. They're not, it's not, a, oh, that looks cool, I'll click and be done with it type of thing. This was a serious decision that they made for the long run. So when we didn't hit our Kickstarter goal, we were pretty easily able to transfer those over to pre-orders on our website, which ended up saving us the Kickstarter fees. 
and still allowed us to retain those relationships with those customers. So it worked out well for us um, in the end, but, um, you know. How, how did you, how were you able to convert them to pre-orders? Does Kickstarter give you contact info for everybody who You can continue to up? update after your Kickstarter's over, whether it's successful or not successful, and that will send out emails to anybody who's actually backed you, um, and it will also post it for anybody who happens to find your Kickstarter through some other way. So there were plenty of, you know, avenues that we had that link out there, and so people who find it today can still go in through the updates and find our website and our all of the information about what's happened since the Kickstarter. So we continue to update that page and update all those people who are original backers. Okay. But now you have their contact info. Exactly. And uh. we were and yeah, and now they're pre orders. So um, like I said, you know, that's a really useful thing for us in being able to finance the business because now we've actually collected that cash and we're able to use that cash to help us get that first order out the door. Awesome, awesome. All right. Um, so, what was the biggest challenge getting started with, with um, I guess with the spice rack, since that's your first kind of first go around in yeah. this new venture? <laughs> what, what was your biggest challenge getting all that set up? Was it the manufacturing? Or yeah, it... we're still going through it. It's still the manufacturing. Um, there's, you know, when you're manufacturing a product, there are a lot of surprise costs, and you have to build that all in from the beginning. Um, luckily we anticipated that we've made a ton of changes since the Kickstarter based on the feedback we received, based on the th just the things that we learned during the Kickstarter, what kind of questions were we getting, all those kinds of things. So it's, it's an every, you know, maybe three times a day back and forth with, between us and our manufacturer. Really? Um, and this has been going on for three months now. And so we are incredibly grateful that we have a manufacturer who, even though we're small and we're new, is taking us very seriously and totally willing to work through these these issues with us. Um, I could really easily see a lot of manufacturers saying, oh, I'm not going to deal with this for you know a couple hundred units. It's not worth it. But luckily, our manufacturer has a long-term view and can really see that this is a, a, a process that once... The, and, the, and the goal, of course, is you get through it once and then it's just a automatic reorders. But, yeah. um, but that is definitely... It's taking us much longer than we expected it to to get all the the exact wood, the exact stains, all of the different um, factors in place. Would you say that that is your biggest struggle currently, or are you running into more issues? I mean, now you're at the point where you're, you're trying to market a lot, right? We, uh, we're kind of in between. So we're just finishing up all the final manufacturing decisions. We're just getting orders placed. Uh, product will ship in December. So uh, now we're just starting to make that transition into full-on marketing mode. And the marketing place is uh, very nerve-wracking and um, there are a lot of different ways you can go but for me that's what I like and that's where I'm comfortable so f for me it's I'm ready to <laughs> get past the manufacturing and start selling stuff that's, okay. that's the part I like so Leah I'm gonna jump in and talk about your successes the the fun part um, can you talk us through something that you're doing currently that is working really well for your business well, we've had really good luck with some of our social networking, social media kind of stuff. Um, lots of good interactions on Facebook. That's been exciting. Um, like I said, the the transition with Kickstarter into pre-orders was really successful. We're super excited about that and how um, loyal and excited our fans have already been and that we're, we were able to pre-sell a large chunk of what our first shipment will be. Okay. Um, so that's that's the part that kind of keeps us going every day and makes us feel that um, you know there are a lot of people out there who have been waiting for a product like this and who are really um, needing this in their lives. Nice. Do you, have you explored other social networks? I know I feel like this would be a a good product and even a good category to have a a strong Pinterest presence or or yeah, something. Yeah, like um, we haven't we haven't got. As a company, we haven't gotten into Pinterest or Instagram yet. Um, I definitely see those as as a, a good strategy for us in the long term. I'm just starting to get some photos from... Uh, I was actually over at a friend's house today setting up one of our prototypes for them um, cool. so we could get you know some feedback from them on how, how it works in their kitchen. We've got six of them that have been out there for six years, but as we make slight changes, it's nice to be able to see that happen in, actually in a kitchen. And so I was able to get some really nice photos from that. Um, 
And as we gather more of these things, I, I see those as a, as a great avenue for us. I personally love Pinterest and love Instagram, so <laughs> they'll be fun for me to do. Um, I'm, 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 a, I'm a little envious of your business already, <laughs> I, will, I will admit. I got I to gotta jump in with a question here just yeah, um, for, for my own satisfaction. I, I'm also in a product-based business, and I struggle with product photography. Do you do it yourself, or oh, do you... It's the worst. <laughs> do, do you contract yes. that out? Thus far, we've done it all ourselves, okay. but we don't have a final, final prototype in hand yet. It should be coming in like the next week or two, and I have to figure out a plan after that. So okay. um, I completely sympathize with you because I think product photography is, is so tricky. Um, you know, it's... It, I don't know. I, we'll see. We'll see where I go with okay. it. But um, you know, you want that for us. We want that beautiful kitchen shot. But we found all these interesting things about photography. It's um, there's been all these questions about. Well, is it too big for kitchens? Well, do we need to have pictures of people standing working with it so that they can so that consumers when they see the product can see it in an actual kitchen situation so they they can see that it's not as big as it seems maybe in a single product shot. There's um, there's all these questions that and so I'm I'm glad we did our own photography first so that we could get um, get some of this feedback before we spend the money on getting the really um, you know professional shots done but I think we're gonna have to go to a professional um, for our final for the once we get the final final prototypes in um, because there are a lot of things that. Uh, I personally can't do. Um, sure. But that was super interesting. When we did um, the Kickstarter, we had to do a video as well, and we ended up doing that on our own too. Um, and we got amazing feedback from it because we kind of thought, oh, it's pretty good. It's good enough for Kickstarter. And, and people really were excited about it, and they were super interested in it. So um, we're, we're actually going to be using part of that um, video on our website um, because it did really give some of that information about the product that, people aren't willing to read. Um, okay. But yeah, that like video and photography has become so, so important, especially with right now, our product is going to be entirely um, online. It's not, we're not selling in stores. So getting all of that feeling for size and what it's going to look like in people's actual kitchens is really important to get that information across, but you get so little time. You've got to get that across so quickly. So I yeah. completely sympathize with okay. <laughs> concerns about modern <laughs> photography. Leah, what other big plans do you have for the future of um, of House Logic that you can speak to? Yeah, I've I've mentioned a few um, already, but our, the obvious next step for us is um, expansion on the um, line of spice racks. So we had originally planned on launching with one product, one design, and now we're up to three. <laughs> so we've wow. got um, three different stain colors. We that was one of the feedback one of the pieces of feedback that we got from Kickstarter really strongly was, um, is it going to match my kitchen cupboards? And I really want the colors to look good in my kitchen. And so now we'll end up having three different um, stain colors, which I'm excited about. I think it's the right way to go. Um, we're also, uh, we just got um, a new partnership going with a company here in Madison um, called Greenbush Shopworks. It's a relatively new company. And what they do is they make... Um, like names for boats and other sorts of decals and signage and things like that. And they're doing um, customized labels for us. So the when you okay. buy the rack, it'll come with a set of 120 labels. So you can choose your 60 for your rack out of that 120. But if you're the type of person who makes your own spice blends, which is actually a fairly common thing out there, or you have Grandpa Jimmy's you know, barbecue rub and you want those labels just exactly with those words on them, we can get that all done for you as well. So that's um, that's an extension that'll be going up relatively soon. And then um, we've had a lot of requests for smaller racks. So right now we've got this, our standard size is 60. Um, we hadn't planned on going smaller because there are more options in the smaller, there are, you know, 48 unit racks. Well, there's one 48 sure. unit rack. There's, there's a few that are um, 24, that sort of thing. But we've had a lot of requests for the 30. Um, originally, I thought that might not be the best direction to go, but I think people are so excited about the design that they, even if they don't have the space for it, they still want to be able to have uh, an all-spice rack in their house. And for me, I have a 60 right now, and then I have a bunch of jars sitting right next to it because I've got too much. I have too many spices at my house. So having a 60 and a 30 would be a good expansion for me. 
And then we'd like to go up as well, 80s, 90s, that sort of thing. Oh. So that's where we see the future for the spice rack um, area. But then for House Logic as a company, like I mentioned, we've got some other ideas that are other areas of your house um, that we can work on. But those are things that we're not talking about yet. Fair sure. enough. Yeah, I, th I think with the name, with the name like House Logic, it really leaves leaves your brand open to all sorts of possible integrations with new digital home products mm -hmm. like uh, Nest. We're just getting into that space and the kind of traditional space that you're currently working in. Yep, absolutely. That so was the idea to be able to have a parent company and then be able to work on various different projects, whatever we find that could be helpful. So, Leah, if you suddenly had $100,000 to spend on your business, what would you use it for in the next week? Well, um, I guess the question is, are you forcing me to use the $100,000? Because like I said, you know, I'm, I'm definitely a penny pincher when it comes to starting businesses. I'd rather, uh, you know, lock down and just hold back. But um, if you're forcing me to spend the money, I'd love a new website designed by somebody who really knows what they're doing. <laughs> I'd love new graphics and new photography, just like you were talking about. Um, all those, it, to me, being a marketing person, the imagery is everything, and it's, it really can give somebody a feeling and a comfort with your brand that you can't ever get through words or any other way. So that that's kind of uh, the meat and potatoes. We've got a few closing questions for you. These are meant to be kind of just quick, rapid-fire type questions. Um, entrepreneurs love to read a lot. Uh, I personally always am in the middle of at least one book, probably two or three. Um, so what's one book that you'd recommend to other people like us that you think, you know, really helped you out? Well, that's a good question. Um, I also have read a lot of books, <laughs> entrepreneurial books. Um, but personally, I'm, I'm a total econ nerd and I, I really love economics books. So all of the free economics books, those kind of things. It's not so much about, um, about the business itself, uh, more so about the way of thinking and how you think about problems and thinking about problems in more of a global sense um, and asking a lot of questions, not being afraid to ask questions, those sorts of things. Um, I think that's incredibly helpful. Um, of course, you know, lean startup, you know, you can't yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> discount that. Um, so. All right, well, we'll have a link to that on your show page then on the website on driventobetter.com. And actually, on a side note, um, Tim Ferriss has a podcast, and I know before we were talking, you like to listen to podcasts. He actually interviewed the authors of Freakonomics. Um, I don't remember what the episode was, but I'm sure you can uh, find it with the almighty Google. might be interesting to you. Um, another question, then, who is your biggest inspiration, um, you know, maybe in the business world or maybe even just uh, in your general life? Oh, that's a really good question. Um... I would say, I mean, traditionally it's been my dad, you know, just having watched that experience of him starting that business. And uh, he was definitely went through the whole working all the time, and, and but he made it a family experience. And um, for me, I have uh, a two-year-old and then another baby on the way in January. That's really important to me that this isn't just a job. This is, this is an integrated part of my life and an experience that my kids are going to be able to see and be involved in. So um, the fact that my parents were able to do that, um, my mom did an incredible amount of work with the company, um, and my brother and I grew up in it. Uh, I hope I can continue that legacy on with my, my family as well. Great. I, I can only imagine. I, I started becoming an entrepreneur around the age of 25 or so, um, I can only wish that, that my family had already started me out sooner so I could have right. gotten a head start on things. So, yeah, I, uh, I hope you can do that too. Um, what's one other tool or resource that you find yourself using quite often in your business? Hmm. Um, Facebook and Squarespace all the okay. time. That's like 90% of my life and my business right now is trying to keep the website going, trying to keep the discussion about the product going, being a marketing person that's and UPS and USPS okay. and shipping things constantly. Um, but you know, it's all fun stuff. So Okay. So for those who don't know that are listening, Squarespace is uh, a website that well allows you to build a website. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's kind of like a uh, the, the, there's templates, right? So it makes yeah, it pretty easy so for I, anybody. With the previous company, when I was with the publishing company, I did it, uh, our website through WordPress, and I don't have any background in any sort of computer programming at all, and I just 
looked it up on Google, said like how to build a website and like figured it out from the bottom up. And uh, that was great, but then nobody else in the company could do anything about it. You know, mm-hmm. if there was any changes or anything like that, I had to go in and do everything uh, myself. And what I love about Squarespace is that I open it up to anybody who wants to do anything and within 10 minutes, they've learned the entire system and, and they can make changes and update things. So great, great. That's been a good thing for us. Good. Well, the uh, the interview is, is coming to an end here. We want to thank you again for taking the time to, to meet with us. Um, last last thing we'll get to is is how can listeners get in touch with you if they want to either order a spice rack or maybe just you know bounce an idea off you or anything like that yeah our website is uh, www.allspicespicerack.com and there's a contact page on there you can get my information on there otherwise you can look me up leah sugar at linkedin or facebook or wherever Thanks again for joining us today. If you like what you hear, head over to driventobetter.com. Check out the show notes where we'll have everything we talked about here today. You can just search the name of the guest or their company, and that should pop up for you. While you're there, consider joining our DTB Plus Club. If you're not sure what that is, some of our guests will come to us with special offers, giveaways, contests, or discounts for our audience. The only way to get these is to become a member of the DTB Plus Club. In addition to bi-weekly emails with these offers, you'll also get exclusive access to the Plus Club private at Facebook page. This is a place where like-minded entrepreneurs and soon-to-be entrepreneurs gather and exchange ideas, tips, and advice. Our guests talk a lot about having a support community, and the DTB Plus Club is just that. The best part is it's absolutely free to join. So head over to driventobetter.com now and check it out. Thanks again. See you next time.